Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I would prefer short and succinct questions and answers to match as usual, please. Question number one, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will review the decision-making processes of the Scottish Medicines Consortium following the decision not to reimburse Vimazim for people with Mokioa syndrome. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robeson. The independence of the Scottish Medicines Consortium decisions on individual drugs is well established in line with what was recommended when the SMC adopted its new approach to orphan, ultra-orphan and end-of-life drugs. There will be a formal review of the new SMC approach in 2015-16 and the Scottish Government is currently working with the SMC in the remit of that review. Alec Ferguson. I'm very grateful to Cabinet Secretary for that response. As she knows, when I first became involved with this issue, those making the case for the reimbursement of Vimazim were very complimentary about the SMC process and rather less so about the process south of the border through NICE. As time has gone on, however, that situation reversed and it's quite clear that while the NICE process was highly inclusive in nature, including roundtable discussions with clinicians, uh, patients and families, the Scottish process was the very opposite. So in drawing up the remit for the review of 2015-16, will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that the process becomes more inclusive so that those most affected are made to feel that they are a valued part of the process rather than feel that they are outside the process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to Alex Ferguson that uh, the consultation will be wide with uh, stakeholders as part of that review and I would encourage uh, him to uh, submit uh, his view and the, uh, and his, the, um, the case that he has cited uh, to the SMC as part of that review. Um, the, we will certainly look at the process and the decision-making process and the issue of inclusivity. I know that he cites NICE as being an example of an inclusive process, but then there are a lot of criticisms of the NICE process as well. I think the new process is better than what we had before, but it, we always said that we would review the new process within the first year of operation. That's what we're going to do, and I will certainly make sure that the issue of inclusivity that the member raises is part of that review, and we'll discuss that with SMC. Thank you. Question number two, Linda Fabiani. Just Sorry, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussion it has had with NHS Lanarkshire since its interim service model for out-of-hours GP services was implemented on 1 July 2015. Cabinet Secretary. Discussions with all NHS boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, are ongoing as part of the National Review of Primary Care Out-of-Hours Services being led by Professor Lewis Ritchie, which will be reporting its findings and recommendations in the autumn. Thank you, Linda Fabiani. Thank you. May I ask the Cabinet Secretary that in any discussion and consideration that she would recognise that East Kilbride is the largest population centre in Lanarkshire, yet has been without an out-of-hours GP service since NHS Lanarkshire interim measure was implemented. Would she recognise that this is an anomalous situation which must surely be rectified in any long-term solution? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, can I say to Linda Fabiani that I certainly expect NHS Lanarkshire to keep the interim service under review and once we have the recommendations from uh, Professor uh, Lewis Ritchie, uh, I expect them to look at those recommendations and to uh, look at whether the interim service is in line with those. They've said publicly that they will undertake a full review with public involvement within six months and that will of course take account of those recommendations which will be coming soon and of course I'll consider Lanarkshire's longer term plans in the light of all of that. Thank you. John Pentland. <clears throat> Cabinet Secretary, we now have further evidence that Lanarkshire's so-called interim GP service out of hours, out of hospital and running out of GPs is not working. <laughs> Despite the reduction in centres from five to two over a, re a recent three-month period, one in nine sessions were unfilled. There is often just one GP out of our centre for the whole of Lanarkshire. I need a question, Mr. Would the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary agree that this is not the service that the people of Lanarkshire deserve and have the right to expect, as promised by the Chief Executive. And can she tell me how much longer she will tolerate this worsening position? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, in terms of the time frame, I've already said in answer to Linda Fabiani that uh, the recommendations of the Ritchie Review are fundamental to not just the way Lanarkshire operates and organises its out of our services, but indeed any other health board. Um, John Pentland uh, talked about the, the interim uh, model, and of course, um, the, issue, the reason why Lanarkshire moved to the interim model because they were saying very clearly that because uh, of patient safety concerns, they couldn't staff the rota. They're telling me now that they are more able to staff the rotas than they were previously and that the service is safe. Or, and, and that is something John Pentland should take on board. But as I've said, I would absolutely expect that going forward, NHS Lanarkshire, uh, their out of our services will uh, be in line with those recommendations coming out of the National Review. And if NHS Lanarkshire want to move to any uh, permanent uh, change in their out-of-hour services, of course, that uh, is an issue that would come to the Scottish Government. So uh, you know, the important thing here is we send a message out to the people of Lanarkshire that their services are safe. I'm sure that's something even John Pentland would want to do. Briefly, please, Jim Hume. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minister might be aware of the reports at the weekend that NHS Lanarkshire are at risk of lo losing their training sta status for junior doctors, vital obviously for out of our services. Uh, I, I would just like to know what the Minister's view is on these very worrying reports. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, I'm very aware of the issue of the training status for uh, junior doctors. Uh, I have been having ongoing discussions, as of my officials, with NHS Lanarkshire about these matters. It's, the NHS Lanarkshire are very clear about the improvements they have to put in place in order to resolve those issues, and I'm very clear that that's what they will have to do, and I will keep a very close eye on those matters. Thank you. Question number three, Richard Baker. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to NHS Grampian to help recruit and retain staff. Cabinet Secretary. NHS Grampian, along with all NHS boards, are required to have the correct staff in place to meet the needs of the service and ensure high quality patient care. The Scottish Government has increased NHS Grampian's resource budget by 6.7% percent to over £830 million pounds for 2015-16. This is above inflation and the largest incre increase of any mainland board, having previously increased by 4.6 per cent in 2014-15. The Scottish Government works closely with all boards to support their staff recruitment efforts. Richard Baker. Uh, thank you. I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the particular concern in the North East regarding GP recruitment with the closure of the Brimond Medical Practice in Aberdeen and other practices being affected by staff recruitment issues. This is an issue which I've raised with the Cabinet Secretary before. Can she provide any further details today on what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle this issue, uh, given that patients are already being affected and some 20% of North East GPs are due to retire next year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, um, we have taken a, a very close interest in the issue of uh, Brimond and other practices in uh, Aberdeen and indeed in the North East. What I can say to Richard Baker is that uh, the board, NHS Grampian, is working very closely to ensure continuity of service for those patients. But in the long, medium to longer term, uh, what is required are new ways of working in primary care. That's why we are discussing with uh, the Royal College of General Practitioners, with the BME and others, about very radically different models of primary care and that the new GP contract from 2017 should facilitate those new models of care. And in fact, there are a number of practices in uh, Aberdeen who are very much uh, trailblazing for the idea of a federated structure of uh, GP surgeries instead of having small, in some cases single-handed practices, that they would come together into a cluster to be able to provide a greater range of services to their patients. Very happy to keep Richard Baker appraised of progress on that matter. Briefly, Mark MacDonald. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Presiding Officer. In relation to the Brimham Medical Group, would the Cabinet Secretary join me in welcoming the launch of the new DICE uh, medical practice which has been launched uh, by the Scotston Medical Group and perhaps conforms to the, the approach of the federated structure which she has announced which will ensure uh, continuity for those patients of the Birman practice who were affected as a result of its withdrawal of general medical services. Cabinet Secretary. I very much welcome the, the new DICE medical practice and indeed the new federated structure. I think the other 
benefit from a, a federated structure is uh, not just the resilience that it brings to uh, general practice and primary care within that area, but it also opens up opportunities for uh, specialist services to be delivered uh, to that, pop that patient population uh, because of the range of experience and skills within that federated structure. So this is very much uh, something that we uh, believe has wider application across Scotland and indeed is informing our discussions with the profession as we go forward. Many thanks. Question number four, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government whether robotic radical prostatectomy is available from the NHS. Maureen Watt. I'm pleased to confirm that two months earlier than planned, robot-assisted surgery for prostate cancer is now available in NHS Scotland. The first robot has been located in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and has been purchased with the help of a £1 million capital contribution from the Scottish Government added to the magnificent fundraising efforts of the people of the North East through the UCAN charity. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Minister for that response? She will be aware, of course, that the outcomes for this type of robotic surgery are vastly improved and recovery times are much quicker. What she will not be aware of is I have three constituents who had to travel to Leipzig and pay for the treatment themselves because Greater Glasgow and Clyde refused to fund the procedure. One of them, a matter of a mere few weeks ago. Given that treatment was available at the new Queen Elizabeth Hospital and should have been offered to my constituent, will she ensure that the money is refunded to him and will she end the postcode lottery of care? Maureen Watt. Well, I'm happy to discuss the particular uh, matter that Jackie Bailey raises with, her, uh, out with uh, the Chamber, obviously. Um, but she will be pleased to know that the West of Scotland has confirmed that this week it purchased a robot and to help deliver minimal invasive invasive radical prostatectomy. An implementation date for that is yet to be confirmed. However, we expect that this will be agreed for following equipment installation and the completion of staff training. Thank you. Question number five, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Court of Sessions' recent decision not to overturn NHS Lothian's withdrawal of prescriptive homeopathic medicine to a Midlothian resident. Maureen Watt. The decision was one of the Court of Session to take and is not a matter for the Scottish Government. Colin Beauty. I thank the Minister for that response. While the scientific benefits of homeopathy are generally unproven, it's clear that even as a placebo, many people find it of great help. Would the Minister outline some of the ways that homeopathy can be supported on the NHS? Minister. Uh, the Member will know that it is, of course, for individual NHS boards to decide what complementary and alternative therapies are made available based on the needs of the resident population and in line with national guidance. We do expect boards to ensure that people receive the appropriate clinical care that meets the totality of their needs and that this care is person-centred, safe and effective. Thank you. Question number six, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to so-called deep end GP practices in the most socio-economically deprived populations. Cabinet Secretary. There is recognition of the additional needs of patients in areas of deprivation and the calculation of Scottish Government funding to GPs for the provision of core services. This is shown in the weighting given to reflect deprivation as a marker for increased morbidity for patients and increased workload for practices covering the essential element of general medical services. Patricia Ferguson. <clears throat> I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And it has long been recognised that patients who attend such practices often suffer from a range of illnesses, as the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, and often they contribute to premature death. But is she aware that such patients are also likely to suffer some 20 years more poor health than those in more affluent areas? And isn't it time that the funding formula for GP practices properly recognised this? concern and the, also the other challenges facing the deep end practices and supported those GPs whose patients suffer most from health inequality, such as the Balmore surgery in Postle Park in my area. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm certainly very uh, well aware of the issues that Patricia Ferguson uh, raises and I uh, have um, a lot of sympathy for the points she makes. I think there is an opportunity as we continue to discuss what the new contract, the first Scottish-only contract from 2017 onwards, will look like. 
and how it will facilitate new models of care. Within that, I think we have to have a very sharp focus on tackling health inequalities. Very happy if Patricia Ferguson wants to uh, continue that dialogue over that issue, but she uh, is very much in line with the, the, my own thinking as we take those discussions forward. Bob Doris. Um, thank you, President <laughs> Officer. Um, I recently met with uh, GPs at the Balmore practice in Postle Park, a, a deep end practice, and they've had me the They've got a unique situation there, and they've made an evidence-led and powerful case for more resources from Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. Uh, and I'm in correspondence with them, and I've also written to the Cabinet Secretary in relation to that. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, whether she would give consideration to my suggestion to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board that the particular stresses that Balmore surgery will experience over the winter period need to be mitigated, and perhaps the Health Board could use some winter resilience monies that it will have in order to get them through that period to the spring, and then perhaps additional resource allocation could be considered, given their unique and powerful case they have made to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I certainly recognise uh, Bob Doris's uh, interest in this matter, and uh, I issued a, a reply to him uh, today. And of course, uh, we all want to make sure that uh, Balmore uh, practice is able to continue uh, with its important work in an area of deprivation. Obviously, the Greater Glasgow and Clyde have been discussing with the practice uh, of how to uh, provide uh, that support, and that has led to uh, some short-term support that the board has been able to provide. In terms of what happens after that, I think it's important that the board continue to discuss with Balmore uh, how they take the practice forward. We need to put that practice onto a sustainable uh, footing going forward. And uh, I would certainly uh, encourage uh, uh, Bob Doris uh, to uh, continue to liaise with Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and I'm very happy to keep him informed of uh, any discussions and to make sure the board are aware of uh, his and other uh, members' representations on this issue. Many thanks. Question number seven, Ken McIntosh. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is experiencing difficulties in recruiting for the four-year GP training programme. Cabinet Secretary. It is NHS Education for Scotland working with the GP National Recruitment Office, which oversees arrangements for selection and recruitment into three or four year GP training programmes. In 2015, National Recruitment 305 GP speciality training posts were advertised in Scotland with 237 filled, resulting in a fill rate of 78%. Of the 305 posts, 172 were for the four-year uh, programme. We are continuing to work with health boards and the medical profession to make general practice a more attractive career option. This includes some redesign of the medical training curricula and by taking forward recommendations from the Shape of Training Review to provide GPs with enhanced skills as part of their training. Thank you. Ken McIntosh. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her reply? I am not entirely sure whether... Uh, from what she says, that she recognises uh, the conclusions of, for example, GPs in my own area, including Dr Ian McCall, that what is currently a problem could in five years become a real crisis. Can I ask her to elaborate on the steps that she's taking to make uh, general practice a more successful, a more attractive long-term career option, and in particular, whether she will reverse the funding cuts that have, the government has made to general practice? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, you can be assured that this issue is a very, very uh, high priority for me and the Scottish Government going forward. But there are a number of issues which are all interrelated. The first is uh, within medical schools themselves, general practice is often not seen as uh, the most uh, attractive uh, special, speciality to go into. There are a range of reasons for that, but we have to change that perception and we have to change the way um, that uh, medical students are, um, are encouraged or not encouraged to go into medical, uh, to, to general practice. So that is one thing. We then need to make uh, the training uh, of GPs more uh, attractive. And of course, some of the enhanced training we're looking at at the moment is about bridging the gap between general practice and hospital. Uh, based practice and whether there are opportunities for uh, some differing models that are blurring more of the boundaries between primary and secondary care. And then there is the whole uh, requirement to 
develop and deliver new models of primary care based around multidisciplinary teams, which uh, will allow the general practitioner to work to the top of their skill level and use their clinical skill training, uh, while other, other health professionals will be able to do some of the other work that GPs can find frustrating and time consuming. Happy to write to Ken McIntosh with further details of all of that. Thank you. Question number eight, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Stuart McMillan. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. And, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of correspondence I have sent regarding the issue of smoking in hospital grounds ceasing from the 1st of October, which will have an impact on Ravenscraig Hospital in Greenock, which provides continuing care and patient services for adult and elderly psychiatric patients, along with rehabilitation and alcohol addiction in patient services. I would be grateful to know of uh, what discussions the Cabinet Secretary has actually had with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to consider introducing contingency measures to assist staff with the smoking ban when it comes into force. How will patients who have limited mobility be able to leave the grounds to smoke? And are there any hospitals in Scotland which have been given an exemption from this policy? Cabinet Secretary. Um, <clears throat> well, I can confirm to Stuart McMillan that uh, a letter um, will be on its way shortly in response to the issues that he raised. Um, I mean, it is a matter for NHS boards to decide whether it would be appropriate and in the interest of patients to, de to designate their mental health outdoor grounds smoke-free. Uh, in line with the, the view of the Mental Welfare Commissioner, the Scottish Government recognises that people with mental ill health face some of the greatest health inequalities. As such, we support action by boards to protect the health of this population group. Where boards have taken the decision to create no smoking outdoor areas, I would expect them to ensure that patients have swift access to smoking cessation support. And of course, we are providing over £10 million a year to boards for tobacco control activity, including the provision of specialist cessation services. Briefly, please, Duncan <coughs> McNeill. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, during the Cabinet Secretary's discussions uh, with the Chief Executive of NHS Glasgow Clyde, uh, did, did she have time uh, to discuss the staggering £44 million uh, maintenance backlog that exists at Inverclyde Royal Hospital, uh, which was reported in 2013, almost double the figure that was reported in 2011? And as I understand that, rather than this figure being diminished, it is increasing, place, placing a huge question mark on the future of our local hospital. Can the Cabinet Secretary give assurances that this issue will be uh, tackled, uh, addressed urgently, to ensure that there is a viable future for Inverclyde Royal Hospital? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, Inverclyde Royal Hospital does have a viable future, so I can confirm and reassure Duncan McNeill on that. In terms of backlog maintenance, uh, we would expect um, all boards to have within their capital plans going forward um, a clear uh, plan, particularly for the essential backlog maintenance, uh, to be taken forward. These are issues that we will continue uh, to discuss with boards, including Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Thank you. Question number nine, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it expects to receive the interim conclusions of the independent review into polypropylene mesh implants and what progress the expert group has made in developing pathways of care for women experiencing complications. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government expects the independent review of transvaginal mesh implants to publish its interim report at the end of this month, the beginning of October. The expert group suspended its activities during the period of the independent review's main work programme and reconvened at the end of August. The new pathways of care for women experiencing complications can now be progressed and evidence gathered by the independent review will inform the configuration of this service. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for her reply and for her continued focus on the issue. And I know, in fact, she will now be giving evidence to the Petitions Committee on October the 6th, and I look forward to engaging with her then on the detail of the report. Although, can she confirm that there is not one surgeon on the group who is not a proponent of polypropylene mesh, and whether this may yet prove to be a cause for concern? And meanwhile, I wonder if she can update us positively on the helpline that was launched on August the 3rd. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, can I say that um, I think the expert group um, and the, the makeup of the expert group 
and the work that the expert group has undertaken um, should be um, respected and should give us confidence and set in, indeed the women I have spoken to directly affected by this issue uh, have been um, very supportive of the work of the expert group. So I think we need to uh, enable it and leave it to do its work and draw uh, its work to its conclusions. Um, in terms of the helpline, um, what I will do is um, write to Jackson Carlow with an update of the use of the helpline. Um, the helpline was very well received by uh, the women concerned. I think uh, their input into the development of uh, the helpline and indeed the recruitment uh, to the helpline has been very valuable indeed. And I would just want to put on record again my thanks to, to the women concerned. Uh, they certainly have uh, had a, a terrible um, uh, experience and have been very badly affected by this, but their intentions and support to help other women affected has uh, been something that I think deserves all of our praise. Thank you. Can I say we're not progressing very far today? I'm afraid questions and answers will need to be briefer. A brief supplementary from Rhoda Grant, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask what progress is being made to reduce the use of these implants and if any woman, woman receiving them, can she guarantee that they are being fully appraised of the risks involved? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, um, most health boards, as I've said before, have suspended mesh implant procedures for stress, urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. Women affected in health boards are eagerly awaiting the findings of this uh, review and, uh, and as I am also. Thank you. Question number 10, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to address the shortage of GPs. Cabinet Secretary. Under this government, the number of GPs employed in Scotland has risen by 7% to 5,000, the highest ever on record. We have also increased investment in primary medical services by over £88 million, and there are, of course, more GPs per head of population in Scotland than in England. However, I recognise that demand is also increasing, which is why I recently announced that over the next three years, an additional £60 million will be invested to address immediate workload and recruitment issues. John McAlpine. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome the investment in general practice. The reason for the shortage of GPs is complex and of course not confined to Scotland however. I have been told um, by uh, insiders in the NHS that the high rates being paid to locum doctors including GPs can exacerbate the shortage as some cho doctors choose to pull out of the NHS and return part time as locums. Given this trend would the Scottish Government support health boards that choose to cap the rates paid to locums? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Joan McAlpine raises uh, an important point. Our long-standing agency locum framework contract already caps the rate at which locums can be paid to the national NHS rates. And the doctors and dentists' terms and conditions of service again ensure a cap rate for locum staff who are engaged through local supplementary staffing services such as the medical staff bank. NHS boards have been advised to use uh, only agencies that are on the nationally agreed contract and to ensure that any local locums are paid at the contractual rate. Briefly, please, Richard Simpson. Yes, um, I welcome the recent statements in support of federated practice or clusters proposed by the RCGP eight years ago. But will the Minister now examine uh, Labour's consultation paper, Fit for the Future, which I've sent to her uh, uh, and to the uh, uh, Dr um, Maureen Watt? Um, it's based on GP responses. Will she or the Cabinet Secretary come to the Chamber with a statement on the developing crisis in GP recruitment and retention? Uh, and meantime, will she ensure that advanced nurse practitioners, where they're being deployed instead of or alongside GPs, are Dr. fully Simpson, qualified? Need to be brief, please. Cabinet Secretary, brief response, well, please. Um, to be fair to Richard Simpson, at least he is trying to develop some uh, labour health policy, and I have looked at uh, his uh, uh, paper. What I can tell him is three things. One is that every single element of his paper is either already happened, is already happening, or has already been under active consideration. There is nothing, there is nothing in his paper that we were not already doing looking to do or planning to do, but I thank him anyway for his, uh, for his thoughts on the matter. Thank you. Question number 11, Alison McInnes. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress in filling GP vacancies across North East Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. 
Senior managers and uh, GP clinical leads within Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership are working closely with practices offering support and assistance where required with advertising and recruitment. Alison McInnes. The Minister will know that the acute shortage of GPs is now impacting daily and directly on local communities across the North East, with surgeries at Gamery, Cominston and Brimond particularly affected, and thousands of patients being displaced to other already busy practices in a, what I must say a fairly ad hoc way. What patient safety at risk assessments does the Cabinet Secretary expect health boards to carry out in such circumstances? And what safeguards have been put in place to ensure that those patients with long-term and complex conditions do not experience any potentially critical disruption Cabinet. to their medical care? Sorry, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, there are two practices in the North East under what are described as special measures, which is the, the board obviously uh, stepping in to support. One is Brimond and the other is Gamery. Uh, in the issue of game, the case of Gamery, it was uh, due to a GP being injured and therefore on sick leave. So some of these things are difficult to predict. But obviously the board has taken swift action and what we can guarantee is patient continuity uh, and making sure that uh, either through um, other practices taking on those patients or indeed a salaried service if, if, as required, um, the boards were expected to respond very rapidly to uh, those cases, whether it's in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire or anywhere else in Scotland. Briefly, Kevin Stewart. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for attending a, a recent meeting, a constructive meeting with GPs, the Health Board and colleagues. At that meeting, uh, it, was said, really it was said that UK pension changes were having an effect and GPs were retiring early. Would the Cabinet Secretary please comment on that and is that Cabinet a real problem? Secretary. Yeah, uh, well, certainly that issue has been raised by uh, the organisations representing uh, general practitioners that actually that has facilitated a more rapid retirement in some cases. Uh, that's not the only issue, though, that we have uh, as a backdrop to some of the challenges with uh, uh, GPs and primary care, but it is an issue. Question 12, Mark MacDonald. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it's supporting primary care in Aberdeen. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is continuing to support NHS boards uh, in this work through investments and initiatives set up to test at scale new ways of working in primary care within Aberdeen. We have supported the development of a cluster model as a basis for improving patient care. This involves six practices across three CHPs with practices in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and Murray with a combined patient population of around 60,000 working together to ensure a fully integrated approach to patient care. Mark McDonald. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary may be aware that part of the work being done to modernise primary care in Aberdeen is being carried out at the Dainston Medical Practice in my constituency. Given the announcements by the First Minister in the programme for government about the Scottish Government's looks to looking to remodel primary care, how will that work feed into that national agenda? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Dainston Medical Practice is one of six practices in the NHS Grampian taking part in this work, which is looking at how we can develop a, a new model of delivery in primary care to address current and future patient demand. Uh, we are, as a government, certainly looking forward to hearing more about the findings from this work and the lessons learnt will, of course, play an important part in informing, informing the work on the future delivery of primary care. Thank you. Question number 13, Stuart Maxwell. What its position is on the Royal Environmental Health Institute of Scotland's reported concerns regarding the capacity of the environmental health workforce in local authorities. What in what? The environmental health staff employed by local th authorities contribute significantly to environmental and public health in Scotland. I know how important it is that we have an effective and experienced workforce. Ministers have met with the Royal Environmental Health Institute of Scotland in the past to discuss these matters and I would be happy to do so again to understand the work that has been undertaken in recent years to address some of the challenges. Stuart Maxwell. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? In 2009, Minister, there were 556 environmental health officers and 105.6 food safety officers employed by local authorities in Scotland. By September 2014, that had dropped to 470.74 EHOs and 77.6 FSOs, a reduction of 85.26 EHOs and 28 FSOs. Given the vital frontline role that EHOs and FSOs do in safeguarding Scotland's public health, 
and the very important educational and therefore preventative role they carry out with food producers in Scotland. Does the Minister share my concerns about the threat posed to public health by the drop in the number of EHOs employed by local authorities? And can the Minister tell me what the Scottish Government can do to ensure that we have enough EHOs and FSOs in Scotland to safeguard our excellent public health standards? The figures described certainly show a decline in numbers. In 2010, the, ne the then Minister for Public Health, Shona Robinson, received a report of a short-life working group that ministers established to look at these issues. That group made a number of recommendations and the Royal Environmental Health Institute for Scotland agreed to take forward some work, in particular on the training and education of environmental health staff and on the establishment of a Scottish Environmental Health advisory group to strengthen local environmental health. I intend to meet this group to understand what work they have been doing in recent years, but again I would be happy to meet REHIS and the Society of Chief Officers of Environmental Health in Scotland to explore what more can be done to support and promote environmental health provision. Thank you. Question number 14, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to alleviate the problems in recruiting GPs across the country. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Scotland continues to have the most GPs per head of population and spends the second highest per head, spends the second highest per head in the UK on primary care. However, we recognise that increasing attendances and recruitment challenges are putting additional pressure on GPs, and that's why last month I announced an additional £60 million to be invested in primary care over the next three years. Jenny Mara. A drop in the ocean presiding officer, huge numbers of GPs retiring, vacancies impossible to fill, highly paid locums having their pick of where to work, doctors leaving for Australia, patient lists closing down. General practice, as we know it, is under threat. Budget, and, that's, and that's what the doctors say. This government has been in power for nine years. Where, where is their prescription to rescue GP services? In Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, again, I'd like to thank Richard Simpson for his ideas on the matter. Um, they're most uh, welcome. However, as I, as I said earlier on, um, we are already doing all of that, have done all of it, or Roger, are please. under consideration of doing those other things. So be assured that Labour's suggestions are things that we have already done or are already doing. What I can say to Jenny Mara is Order. £60 million is not a drop in the ocean. It is a substantial investment over the next three years. However, working with the Royal College of GPs and the BMA and others, the most critical thing is devising and looking at new models of care. Of course, we will ensure that those new models of care are properly funded and that we have the workforce uh, required to deliver those new models of care. And hopefully, instead of capping from the sidelines, Labour will support that move. Question number 15, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what evidence it has that orthopaedic specialisms are meeting the needs of patients. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The uh, Scottish Government works closely with the Scottish Committee of Orthopaedic and Trauma Consultants to ensure that each orthopaedic subspecialty is providing high quality care for patients as well as monitoring clinical outcomes. However, it is for individual health boards to plan services, including orthopaedics, to meet the needs of their local population. Rob Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and our Health Board has had rather a long waiting list for some of these things. Is the availability of consultants in rural areas keeping pace with the demand as the population ages and operating on uh, knees and hips does keep people active and mobile longer? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Rob Gibson raises an important issue about the recruitment of consultants to um, our remote and rural areas and NHS Grampian and uh, NHS Highland have been uh, quite innovative in looking at how to uh, recruit consultants onto networks which would involve them working in perhaps a large hospital but also spending some of their time in the rural general hospitals as well. These are exactly the type of developments that we need to see in order to ensure that our rural and remote populations get access to the services they require. Rob Gibson will also be uh, aware that we are looking at elective capacity going forward and ensuring that we uh, have enough elective capacity uh, in order to meet the needs of patients, particularly in the area of hips, knees and eyes. 
Thank you very much. Um, that concludes questions this afternoon. And we're now going to move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14327 in the name of Richard Lockhead on agriculture, current challenges facing the sector and opportunities. I'll allow a few seconds for members to change places and I'll invite members at this point to press the request to speak buttons if they wish to participate in this debate.